Hey everyone, Mr. Fugay here, and this video is going to serve as an introduction to section 3.3 of AP Calculus, which we are going to talk about how to find derivatives of inverse functions. So on the screen right now, you are looking at just a quick review of inverse functions from pre-calculus and algebra 2. And the main notion I need you to take away from this is that a function is going to be an inverse of another function if, and there are kind of two ways for you to look at this. So one of the ways here is looking at it from like a function composition standpoint. If you take one function and you plug it into the other, essentially all of the operations will cancel each other out as they are inverses of one another, and you're left with just x. And you can put the, you know, reverse it. You can take the other function and plug it into the first function, and the same thing here will happen as well. Um, another notion, another quick notion for most people is if you have an equation like y equals x squared minus 3, the quickest way to be able to find the inverse is quite simply just switch the variables around, and that's essentially going to create your inverse. So these two functions that you're looking at on the screen, those will be considered inverses. And this point right here is going to exemplify what I just mentioned right there. And we call those points, by the way, so when you have individual points, um, that are just flipped from one another, we call those symmetric points. So we want to make sure we remember that um, because there is a question I want you to think about throughout this lesson, through your practice, and as we move on, is what relationship exists between the slope of the tangent line of symmetric points? And a visualization of that before we get into the lesson itself is looking at this drawing, here is point A comma B. Here is what the slope of the tangent line looks like of A comma B. The symmetric point is over here. Remember that uh, graphs of inverse functions are also symmetric about the line y equals x. That is why that red dotted line is there. Here's the slope of that one. What relationship do they have? Here's another pair of symmetric points also. Okay, What relationship do those slopes have? So we're going to use this lesson to help us try to discover this as it's pretty important for the main concept of this lesson. So before we actually get into finding derivatives of inverses, there's one other thing we need to know about, and that is the existence of an inverse function. Notice that I'm calling these functions and not equations. And so functions, remember, have some special qualities. Essentially, they need to pass the vertical line test. That is, every x must have only one unique y value. So in order for an inverse function to exist, we have to say that the inverse will be a one-to-one -one function. And another way for us to look at this from a calculus standpoint is that if f is strictly monotonic on its entire domain, therefore it must be one-to-one, -one, and then it has an inverse. So in order to show that an inverse function does exist, we're going to have to show that the function is monotonic. So what does monotonic mean if you need a review or a refresher? A monotonic function is a function which is non-increasing or non-decreasing. Now that seems sort of backwards. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you just say that it only increases and only decreases? And that's pretty much what it means. In other words, it can strictly increase or strictly decrease, but here's the caveat I want you to remember here that I'm circling, okay? A monotonic function can have a value where it doesn't increase or decrease, but ultimately it cannot change direction. A good example to prove this to you would be the graph of x cubed, okay? graph of x cubed looks like this. And what we can see is, okay, well, it's increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing. But right here at zero, it doesn't increase, okay? Um, but, and you can prove that, by the way, but if you take the derivative and set it equal to zero, you would get a horizontal tangent line. However, it doesn't change direction. It doesn't ever start to decrease. So therefore, it continues to increase. Therefore, this will be an example of something that is monotonic. So the x graph of x cubed, at least y equals x cubed, is considered a monotonic function. So how can we prove it? So graphically, the function must pass the horizontal line test. So if you have the ability to graph something, if you have a calculator, um, Desmos, or any kind of graphing utility, you can use that and essentially say, well, it needs to pass the vertical line text to test to be a function. It needs to pass the horizontal line test to be monotonic. Um, that's not going to be the more common way. In fact, what we're actually going to be looking at here is algebraically. We're going to find the first derivative and show that all of the slopes are either greater than or equal to zero or 
less than or equal to zero. So it needs to either be scenario number one or scenario number two. If neither of those scenarios apply, then we're going to simply say, nope, it's not going to be monotonic. So let's look at some examples of this, all right? So we're going to look here at example 1A and 1B. I have some stuff circled here. So uh, looking at this, graphically, I think this is pretty easy. Um, but looking at this, you can see that this is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing all the way. Now, here we go. At x equals uh, 2, it looks like, there's a vertical asymptote. That doesn't actually make the graph change direction because ultimately what happens to the graph after x equals 2 it's continuing to decrease. So it is a non-increasing function. It is a non-increasing function means it never increases. Therefore, this is going to be considered monotonic. And there it is. Okay. Example 1B, we kind of already talked about this, so I think I spoiled this one. But as you're looking at it, you can see it's increasing, it's increasing. There is indeed going to be a horizontal tangent line here. But since the function is not changing direction, it continues to increase. Conversely, I also mentioned the, the horizontal line test. So I'll draw a horizontal line on the screen. And you can also just simply take a horizontal line, drag it across, and see that there are never any places where it's touching the graph more than once. Therefore, we can say that both of these are going to be considered monotonic. So this is going to be it as well. So I'd like you to pause this video, and I'd like you to try examples 1C and 1D and see what you come up with. Come back. So if you've tried 1C and 1D, we will see that both of them actually are going to fail the horizontal line test. As you can see, I can draw a horizontal line right there. I can draw a horizontal line right here and prove that these are not going to be monotonic. Now, the directions at the top here, and I forgot to mention this in the previous um, instructions, it says if it is not, restrict the domain to make it one-to-one. -one. So what's interesting about this is basically I would look for a turning point. So like right here, there's a place where it changes direction, where it goes from increasing to decreasing. So I would start my interval there, and then I essentially could draw everything that now is going to be non-increasing in this example. So an example of the restricted domain here is we could say zero to infinity. Also, you could have said negative infinity to zero. That would have also been acceptable based on the way this is looking. So there are multiple correct answers for this. As for 1D, same thing. I'm going to look for a turning point. So let's take a look right there, and let's take a look right here. Between these two points right here, this function is only increasing and or zero. It is never decreasing. So it is a non-decreasing function on that interval. So we could go with that. Um, so that's actually going to be, uh, let's see, so that would give us, that's negative one and that's positive one. So keeping in mind of our functions here, this would be negative pi over two comma to pi over two. So between negative pi over two and pi over two, the function is always increasing. It is an, and or zeros, therefore making it non-decreasing. There are obviously a multitude of other answers you could go with here, but this is the one that we're just going to show here. Let's talk about how we do this algebraically. So if we're looking at doing this algebraically, what we need to do here is take the derivative first. So let's do this with 2a. If I take the derivative, uh, x to the fourth is going to just, or over 4, it's going to be x cubed minus 4x. So once we've come up with that, we need to look at any places where the derivative is equal to 0 because based on what we learned from the intermediate value theorem, a function, even if it's a derivative, can only change from positive to negative when it crosses zero. You cannot, if it's a continuous function, it has to cross zero. So if we identify all the possible places where we could cross, we are then going to be able to really easily see what we're looking at here. Uh, the best way to do this would be to factor this like such. Um, and when you solve this, you get x equals zero. And then this is going to be x equals plus or minus two. Now, these are not places where it is changing direction. These are places where it might be changing direction because the derivative is zero. So in order to verify this, what I'm going to do is create a little bit of a number line. We're going to do something called a sign chart. And the whole purpose of this sign chart is for me to just give a visual perspective here of what the derivative is actually doing in each of these three areas. So for example, when a the derivative, that is, we're talking about the derivative, when the derivative is less than negative 2, 
what is the sign of the function going to be? I don't really care about the number. I care about the sign. So in this case, if we take a negative, or sorry, a negative 3, let's say, right? You plug it in. We know that negative 3 cubed is going to be what? That's almost that's negative 27. Um, negative 4 times negative 3 is positive 12. Negative 27 is bigger than that. Therefore, from this whole interval, the function is going to be negative. The reason I only have to test one value, remember, is because to the left of negative 2, there's never another place where it touches 0. Therefore, the function must always be decreasing less than negative 2. Um, between negative 2 and 0, we can plug in a number like a negative 1. And when we do that, we're going to get negative 1 plus 4, which means that we're going to get a positive answer. And so all the values of the derivative between negative 2 and 0 are going to be positive, And there it is. There's our major problem. So because we see that it is changing signs, we can pretty much stop our work right here and say immediately that f of x is not monotonic. So f of x is not monotonic. If we continue to this, I believe this goes negative and this goes positive. That's not a guarantee that that's always going to happen, but it happened in this example. Let's look at 2b. So in 2b, same thing. We're going to take a derivative. So let's do that first. We get negative 1 minus 3x squared. And so when we set the derivative equal to 0 here, again, we're looking for all possible places where this could occur. We're going to add 1 to the other side. We're going to divide by negative 3. We're going to then take the square root, and therein lies our problem. Okay? There is going to be no real solutions to this. Is the square root of a negative number is an imaginary or complex number. What this is telling me is that since f prime of x does not equal 0, think about what this means. That means it can never cross 0. Therefore, it can never go from a negative slope to a positive slope. It is impossible for the derivative to do that since it cannot cross the value of 0. So since f prime of x is not, never equal to 0, the function is indeed going to be monotonic. So that's going to be our conclusion for 2b. So at this point of the video, I'd like you to pause one more time, and I'd like you to try letters 2c and 2d. And when you're ready, press play, and I'll have answers for you. Here we go, guys. So for 2c and 2d, let's talk about this. So for 2c, even though f of x, we found it to be undefined at x equals negative 1. So when I took the derivative, let me get my highlighter out here, Phil, let me. Oh, there we go. Sorry about the delay there. So since we set the denominator equal to 0, well, let's remind ourselves here that the function here, the derivative, never equals 0. It is undefined at x equals 0 based on the information here. Or actually, I take that back. It's undefined at negative 1. So when I plug in negative 1, the denominator is equal to 0. Even though you have an undefined value, much like that reciprocal function we saw earlier with the asymptote, the function, though, never decreases. So what I did here on my sign chart is I looked at negative 1, and I said, OK, well, I looked to my left, and I plugged in a number, and I got a positive value. And to the right, I got a positive value. So there sometimes can be a situation where the function can change direction at an asymptote. So we're also going to need to look at it from that perspective. And when we're doing that, we can see, okay, the function is increasing to the left. It's increasing to the right of the undefined value. Therefore, same thing here. This is going to be monotonic. As for 2D, take the derivative. The easiest way to set this thing equal to 0 is to write it as 1 over cosine squared. And same thing as the previous problem. There's never a place where it's not equal to 0. You do have to look at, okay, it's undefined at pi over 2 or negative pi over 2, but since that's not in the interval that they gave us in the problem, we can make the conclusion that it is going to be monotonic. So that will conclude this video. The next video you'll be watching will talk about how we can find derivatives of functions after we've made the conclusion that they're monotonic. Thanks for watching.